Let me ask you a question. Do you remember what you wanted to be when you were really small, three, four, five years old? Do you remember those first times you might have discovered the world of professions? Maybe you saw a fireman or a policeman or a teacher or what your parents were doing and you thought, that's what I'd like to learn to do. That's something I'd like to do when I grow up. Do you remember? For me, the memory is very, very clear. I was five years old and we were on a holiday at the beach. I'm Australian, so I spent a lot of time at the beach. That day, I wasn't actually at the beach. In our hotel, there was a disused room. And in that room, all the furniture was covered with cloths. The tables were turned up, the chairs were turned up on the tables. And there was a piano in one corner. Now, I don't remember what I was doing in that disused room at five or why I opened the piano and sat down and began to experiment, to play with the piano. But I do remember, even today, what happened next. It was like something had switched on in my brain, some part that hadn't even been working up to then. It was like I could suddenly smell and hear. Here was something I could do. Well, I couldn't actually at that stage, but here was something I'd discovered that was awaking something deep in me. Already that first day, I was passionate. I was lost in the experience of just sitting and exploring this piano. So lost, in fact, that I think I spent several hours just sitting there, fooling around, exploring, doing stuff. And I didn't even notice when my parents arrived in the doorway and stood there silently watching. I think they'd been there for some time, actually, before I even came out of my world and realized that they were there. That day, I discovered something that was going to be incredibly important to me, something that I'm passionate about still today. But on that day, what I discovered wasn't enough. It was just something I liked. It was something that I could have fun with. It was a passion. But it was going to become something more important in my life. And in order to make that transformation, I was helped along the way by a number of great teachers. And I mean that word seriously. I think I've been lucky to have several really great teachers. The first of them was Anna Jokiewicz. She was a Polish concert pianist. How she had ended up in the small country town in Australia where I grew up is a mystery. She came from another world. She came from Europe. She was used to doing recitals. When I first met her, I walked into her sitting room. And sitting there, taking up most of the space, was a grand piano. It was taking up most of the living room, and the back leg had somehow been lost in, in the voyage from Poland to Australia. It was sitting on a stack of music. Anna was absolutely passionate about music and what she did. She said, this is a Bosendorfer. This isn't just any piano. This isn't a Steinway, the sort of grand piano you see in concert halls. Those things are flashy, but with those pianos, you press a note, and it sounds good. It doesn't matter, really, what note or who presses it. This piano, this Bosendorfer, this is something you have to work at. It's a noble instrument. It's great for Chopin and Beethoven. But you won't get any easy things from this. You'll have to work for the sound, your whole body. Anna seemed like a purist to a lot of people who knew her. She would lecture parents of school children, say, listen, your child has to stop playing tennis. He can't play tennis and piano. Tennis is developing the wrong muscles. It's stiffening the wrist. You have to choose. Now, that was a pretty difficult choice for eight-year-old Australian kids. Sport is religion. And a lot of people thought she was this crazy, classical, European person. But what I discovered pretty quickly was that it was going to be important, if I wanted to do something seriously, to choose, to make some difficult choices, and to work really hard. She showed me, on that very first lesson, her hand. And she bent into a fist, and she showed me this muscle here. It was like a mini bicep from hundreds and hundreds of hours playing the piano. I looked at mine. <laughs> no bicep there. And we were going to spend hours and hours and hours working on getting better physically at what was happening. But I learned later with my second piano teacher, it wasn't all about technical skills and physically working hard. There were other things. My second teacher, Bruce Keck, taught me piano, but he also taught me a lot about literature and philosophy and history and what things meant. And I remember very, very clearly, one day I was at a lesson and I was working on a foray nocturne. And this is a piece that, it's not really very hard. 
I'll play you just the start. It's simple and slow. So I hadn't really practiced very much. It's, I already thought I was pretty good. So I rocked up at this lesson and I played the first few notes. And I don't think I got much further than that. <laughs> when Bruce went, no, no. He said, that's just so agricultural. <laughs> I was deeply insulted. No disrespect to farmers, but I didn't want my piano playing compared to that. He said, this opening, slow and simple, what does it mean? What's 4A trying to say? I had no idea. He said to me, if you don't know what it means, you can't play it. Otherwise, it's this trite parlor music. It's like bad cabaret. What you don't understand is Foray here, he is the apogee of French culture. It's the turn of the 20th century. The Eiffel Tower is being built for the Universal Exposition. The Impressionists are just beginning to paint. Stravinsky is there with the Ballet Russe. Jazz is becoming popular. Women in France are still fighting to vote. Art Deco is all the rage. This culture is at its peak and hasn't yet begun to imagine the decades of darkness that will follow. 2,000 years or more of French culture are going to bloom and flourish in a few short years. This music embodies that. This is joy and fulfillment. This is regret and longing. This music is ephemeral and futile, but it's also eternal and sublime. But you're playing it like you're a farmer sitting on a tractor in a field. It took us most of an hour just for Bruce to become satisfied with, uh, I was beginning to get it. And I'll try, even today it's difficult, to show you what the difference is. As I said, it's still difficult even today, the meaning. So I'd, mis I'd underestimated 4A. I thought it was easy because it was technically easy, but expressing something, the meaning wasn't easy. There were also pieces that were technically hard, and this was the time for a different kind of lesson. I was working with Bruce on a Beethoven sonata. There's a passage in there that's quite tricky in terms of the turns. It's this part. In that lesson, it wasn't working. I just wasn't getting it right. That little passage where it's, the returns, it's coordinated, it wasn't working. Bruce said, stop. I think I know what's happening. Let me guess, when you're rehearsing this, you start at the beginning, you play that, you like that, and then you get to this point and you just sort of fluff along, stagger through it, and then you move on. You know what you're doing? You're teaching yourself the mistake. You're repeating it in there with the bits you like, the easy stuff, that's fine. But then when you get to something difficult, ah, you just sort of stagger along. And you're programming your brain to fail here. What I want you to do this week is not play the piano at all. I want you to sit every day for 15 minutes in a chair and think about playing that bit, just that bit perfectly. He said, you shouldn't avoid the difficult things, you should concentrate on them. You need to find a way forward that works for you. Otherwise, you'll never get beyond this level where you are now. If you play what you like, what's easy, and then you stop when it gets hard, that's where you'll stop. In two years, if you beat this part, that will seem easy. But other things 
will have become difficult. And he was right. As I worked my way through studies and I went to the conservatorium as a pianist, exams, competitions, there was always something harder to do, always more stress and pressure. By the time I was doing my final year at the conservatorium, I would play often more than six hours a day. I even fell asleep playing once at the piano. Now the problem is with that amount of effort trying to get perfect, that transforms a little bit what you're doing. When I finished my final studies and I began to learn to conduct, I realized afterwards that I really stopped playing almost totally for about three or four years. Why? I'd lost something from that first day when I was five and the joy of the piano all the way through my studies. I'd worked hard, I'd found the meaning, I'd found ways to succeed and to learn the difficult stuff, but I'd lost something important. One day, a few years later, I was again alone in a room with a piano. No teachers, no jury for the exam, no audience, no one. And I sat down with the piano again, and I began to play. It was Schubert. Not very well. I hadn't played in three or four years, but just for myself, for the pleasure, for the passion of the music. And from that day forward, I began to play again, but I played differently. I began to write film music to compose. I was still conducting. I started to play again. I even began to write some pop music because what I, understood, what I understood was really important was that I was doing it in the end for myself, not for somebody else, and to come back to that passion that had led me there in the first place. Thank you very much. <laughs>